Hi everyone, I'm Mike and this is the Sunday Art Show. This week we have our second viewer request video. Uh, so this is for Lisa Gale who wrote in and said, or left a comment, she didn't write in, and said, uh, can you paint a steer? So we don't have too many, uh, you know, longhorned cattle in, in Devon, so I've, I've used Pixabay, which is a free reference photo website, royalty free. And I found a nice picture of a Texas Longhorn. So I'm using that as my reference. And as I often do, I'm using a, a watercolour marker. This is a, a, a blue marker and mixed media paper. This particular paper is A3 in size. So double the size that I use when I'm typically painting outside. And as you can see, I'm just putting in a loose indication of the head of the head of the animal. So these huge horns, I've tried to keep the lines, you know, flowing and fairly loose because we can always make minor adjustments later on in the process. And the key I find when I'm drawing animals is, or, you know, anything really, is to try and keep things very, very simple at the early stages. And really, if you can follow that rule, keep things simple throughout the painting, that generally produces better results than trying to depict every single detail. So what I do when I look at an animal like this, you know, it's quite a complex set of shapes, but I just try and bolt it all together with as few lines as possible and still capture, you know, what's going on. So I, I will look at the torso of the animal and, and think, well, which lines do I actually need to include at this stage? What's the minimum I can do? And, you know, this is quite a quick process. You know, you can see my pen nib going back and forth as I work away. You know, we don't have to get it exactly right, as I mentioned a moment ago. But I am taking little measurements as I go. So, um, for example, when I draw the belly or the position of this leg I'm putting in now, I'll look at my reference and, you know, say to myself, well, is that leg directly below the tip of the right hand horn or is it slightly to the left? And again, I don't need to replicate the photograph exactly, but we want this thing to look fairly realistic, albeit in a stylized way. The other route you can go, of course, if you do want to depict something which is, you know, a near perfect replica uh, of your reference, then you can simply uh, overlay a grid of squares on top of the reference photograph and you can simply grid up your, your drawing and do it, do it that way if you prefer. I don't like working that way. I, I feel I lose some of the spontaneity in my work if I, if I do that. Uh, plus, it's much more time consuming, I think, to, to do it that way. But you can see now we've got you know, a reasonable outline of this animal, a reasonable sense of movement of this steer on its way from right to left. And I'm just making some additional adjustments to the line of the head here, kind of refining the lines. Minor adjustments being made to the, the side of the head there. And, you know, there's always a little bit of a um, little bit of a balance to strike. Uh, so, for example, you can see that I've increased the, the size of the snout and the, the length of the, the head quite dramatically there from what I had before. Uh, I obviously didn't measure that you know, quite right the first time round. So that's a, 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 an alteration which definitely needed to be included. However, you know, I don't want to get too caught up in trying to perfect everything at this stage, because undoubtedly, as the painting progresses, I'll change my mind on certain things. Uh, and that's usually because when you put one colour next to another or one tone next to another, you find it, or for me, you know, it, I find that it doesn't work always in the same way that I had in my head. Sometimes it will work much, much better than I thought it was going to, and other times not so great. But what I did just a moment ago was spray the surface of the painting with water, and that just helps the acrylic paint that I'm using. So I'm using the Atelier Interactive Acrylics, as I, as I often do. And just that little spray of water onto the mixed media paper, it just helps that first layer of paint flow rather more easily than if you were going straight onto dry paper. Um, now, the other thing I'll often do is I'll coat the paper at times with conventional acrylic and then painting on top of that dry surface that really helps the paint glide. But this is a this is a pretty good quick, quick way of doing it as well. So as I'm popping in this first layer of colour, I'm keeping the paint quite thin so the brush marks 
are still apparent. And as you can see, I'm beginning to get a sense of three dimensions because the brush strokes that I've used describe the shape of the animal. So there's a nice curved uh, arcs of, of, of brush stroke around the belly of the animal and then around the neck and the legs. You know, I'll, I'll use brush strokes in different directions to depict whatever is going on. Now, while I'm doing this, I'm also, as I work around the animal, I'm still checking the lines that I put down originally. So in many cases, hopefully I've done a reasonable job and I'll more or less be colouring in, in the sense that I won't be changing the outline of the shape I've got. But in other areas, you know, there will be mistakes and so I'll correct those as I go. So no matter which stage of the painting I'm in, I'm, I'm still co I'm constantly looking with a critical eye, trying to optimise the image. And sometimes I actually I quite like to leave a painting just with one layer of paint and some line work. Uh, sometimes that spontaneous reaction to a subject, uh, you know, it's far more powerful than something you've laboured over. But this is a rather uh, lovely orangey brown I feel I've got here. And the palette I'm using today for the most part is titanium white, cadmium yellow, ultramarine blue and then brilliant magenta. So rather than use a red at this early stage, having the magenta and the yellow allow me to mix up a whole range of different reds and oranges. And it's a good way to sort of make you consider, well, what kind of red do I want here? And then, of course, once you've got an orange, you can add a touch of blue and then that orange starts to become a brown. So by having the magenta and the yellow and then adding a touch of blue, you can really start to play, play around with uh, all the different types of brown that you can, you can imagine, really. So while I was chatting away there, you can see I've filled in the, the area of most of the head. And now I'm coming in with a deeper shadow colour. This is kind of a purpley brown, although, as you can see, it's, it's, it really is quite purpley. So I guess it's more of a browny purple, perhaps, is a better phrase. And I'm gently blocking in the main areas of deep shadow on the animal. So the animal's head, the cow's head, is casting a shadow down across its chest. And the underside of the belly uh, is also in shadow. So again, keeping in mind the direction of the brush strokes. And while I'm there with with that colour of paint, the tail is mostly in shadow as well, or has some shadow areas at least. So it's good to put down a bit of shadow. And having this wet surface, which I just refreshed with the spray bottle, again, it keeps the paint just a little bit fluid and makes for more expressive marks. So you can see I'm adding a little bit more water to the surface there as well. The spray bottle is really good, though, it tends to minimise the risk of drenching the paper. Now, the cast shadow from the head, which extends onto the right hand foreleg, that curve of that shadow again helps to describe the three dimensional nature of the upper leg, the cylindrical form you've got there. So again, I'm keeping things fairly simple, I've only, you know, not including the outlines. I've only used two colours so far. Um, we're getting a little bit of mixing of colour with the interactive acrylics. When you put wet onto fresh paint, they do mix together rather in a rather lovely way. Um, you don't want to overdo that mixing. You don't want the colours to get muddy. But if you're fairly gentle and considered, then um, you know, it, it usually works really quite well. Now, I've run out of paint on the tip of the bristles of the brush now. So I'm using a little bit of a dry brush technique to add some shadows on the horns. You can see... Again, I've created a 3D effect and simply leaving the underlying paper showing through helps to create the illusion of white uh, of light uh, falling on top of the cow, on top of the steer. Uh, and again, I've popped in some little shadow areas for the eye and a shadowy region for the nose as well. And still going with that same colour. Just putting in the cast shadow that the animal uh, is creating on the ground. And again, within the shadows, we can have a range of different tones and brush strokes, and we can use those to depict what's going on on the ground. So very rare that a cow is going to be standing on a completely level, mirror smooth finish. So generally speaking, the shadows that they cast are going to be wobbly. 
you know, as you can see, those two branches coming out forwards represent the shadows that the horns are casting on the ground. And you can see how I've deliberately broken up the shadow of the right hand branch there. So all of these little things help to create the illusion that um, the animal is occupying a space somewhere in nature. You know, there's a little bit of a randomness to it. So I've added quite a lot of white to uh, some magenta. Probably a little bit of yellow in here, if memory serves me correctly. And, and I'm using that for the, for the highlight colours on top of the animal's body. And once again, staying with that same colour, the idea is to move around and across the animal using that colour as widely as possible. So certainly don't want to force a colour into a place where it doesn't work. But, you know, while that colour's mixed up, and while it's on the brush, you know, why not put it everywhere it needs to be? Now, of course, what does tend to happen once in a while, at least with me, is that I think I've, I've done it all. And then 10 minutes later, I realise, oh, I could have used that colour over there as well. So, you know, none of, none of these things are, are perfect or very rarely. But uh, in general, just keeping things simple. So one colour at a time, cover as much of the area as possible, uh, tends to bring the animal it to life fairly quickly. You know, if you go with a mid-tone, a dark tone for the shadows, and then a lighter tone for the highlights, just those three simple steps, you begin to create something which looks fairly reasonable, fairly quickly. So continuing to, to do this, and again, once again, I'm using my half inch flat brush. And the reason I like those so much is you can just by angling the brush, you can instantly convert it from a, a broad stroke uh, paintbrush, if you like. And just by using the edge or the corner, you can create a little bit of a line or even a dot. What I'm adding now, though, is something of a yellow ochre that I've mixed up. So that's been mixed up with you know, mostly yellow, some of the magenta and then a little touch of the blue. You don't want to overdo the blue because then it become too greeny in colour. But um, you do need just a little touch of blue to create yellow ochre. And my hope is, as I paint in these horns, is that uh, some of the shadow work that I did before, once the paint dries, I'm hoping some of that will show through. So there's our cow pretty much done in terms of its uh, first layer of paint. Just going round again now, while I've got that yellow ochre on the brush, and adding a little bit of the... Uh, reflected more subdued highlights that are perhaps where the light is perhaps bouncing up off the ground and up onto the animal's belly. So those highlights won't be as bright as the ones up on top. But now having added uh, a little bit of magenta to that mix I'm using so this particular uh, longhorn, uh, longhorn uh, steer was on kind of a sandy very dry area. So I've added a little bit of magenta to the mix I was using before for the horns and as you can see, I'm kind of scumbling that in to fill in the ground area. So I'll just jump ahead a little bit on the video just to save you watching me paint in the background. So as you can see, I've also painted a blue in on the, the background uh, above that little horizon line I put in. And that was simply mixed up with uh, titanium white and a little bit of ultramarine blue. So I'm now coming in with much more of the titanium white, still with that blue mix though. So I kept that little bit of blue on the brush, but I've added a lot more titanium white. And I'm using that to pick out some brighter highlights along the lengths of both horns. But once again, as I do that, I am keeping in mind the shape of the surface. So because the horns are cylindrical, I'm putting down curved brush strokes. So a little bit of a focus problem there, sorry about that, but the uh, Hopefully you'll be able to see once my hand is out of the way that I'm also adding some highlights to the top of the head of the animal. And again, those brush strokes are in keeping with the shape of the animal's head. So they're rather straighter than those on the horns. So um, continuing with this light color, adding a little bit more contrast in certain areas. And the great thing with the interactive acrylics is that if you put down a patch of colour and you realise, oh, you know, that didn't quite work or the effect is a bit harsh, 
then you know you can spray the surface of the painting with water and just very gently soften those areas that you've put down and in some cases you can even lift them off now because of the way I'm working today uh, if I, I would have to be rather careful if I try to lift off an area of paint completely and unless I just made you know such a, a dire mistake that I thought oh, okay that bit just hasn't worked at all but you know then I can spray the paint with water and, and mop it up with a pa with a paper towel to kind of remove that area but um, because I've got underlying interactive acrylic underneath the top layer I've got to be a bit more careful if I choose to do that if I try to lift off the top layer of paint so in some of my uh, earlier videos, so if you go back to some of the really early videos on the channel before I started posting regularly, I've done some some paintings where um, I did a painting of a Dartmoor horse. I did a painting of some sheep and a lamb up on Dartmoor and also some cows, I think three cows uh, in a Devon field with a Devon landscape behind. And those are fairly long paintings. They're sort of split up into 16 or 17, 10 minute videos. Uh, but in those paintings, I put down a layer of conventional acrylic first and then put the interactive on top. So if you're interested in that technique, then perhaps something to, to have a look at. So while I've been chatting away there, I've continued to add highlights. And one of the things I just did was just very gently feather the brush across that area of deep shadow on the on the steer's chest and that's a really nice way to get a textured and layered effect is to have a dark underlayer and then just very lightly drag a lighter colour over the top. But I've switched to my round brush now just feeling the need to add a little line of shadow on the underside of the right hand horn just to try and bring that horn forward from the body a little bit and for this particular uh, application my flat brush wouldn't really have done the job at least not for the effect I want in this case I want a rather more refined line that I would be able to obtain quickly for, along the length of that horn but I'm just further enhancing some of the shadows with a light purple color so mixed up with magenta and ultramarine blue and titanium white so I'm all for using the biggest brush possible for as long as possible because you can get so much done, you can be so expressive and frankly it's just really good fun. But there are times where I say to myself, okay, if I use a big brush here, I'm going to mess up my painting. And in, in those situations, I, um, I, I then switch to the smaller round brush. Now the underlying shadow on the left horn is rather darker than the one on the right. So although we were using the same colours as as widely as possible across the entirety of the steer early on. Um, later on, I try to become more discerning about the, the, sh the colours in the shadows, how light and dark those shadows are, and not just in terms of observing what's actually happening in my reference, or if I'm working from life, what's actually happening in the real world, but just in terms of, you know, what do I think is going to work well for this particular image? So, for example, the shadows on the right-hand horn are rather more bluey, than the ones on the left and that blue on the right hand horn is nicely complementary to the oranginess of the brown on the torso of the steer however for the left hand horn because I've got that rather light blue background my thinking at this point was well perhaps I need a, a darker more reddish shadow on that left hand side so that's that's why I went in that direction so adding a few more refining lines now uh, with the round brush. And, you know, one of the things you can do um, to try and loosen up your painting is not hold the brush too tightly. So if you look at different people, when, if you're ever out and about in a coffee shop or wherever you are when you see people writing something down, um, just take a moment to see, oh, that's just my cat on the left there coming in <laughs> to the edge of the camera. He likes to inspect the work once in a while. Um, whenever you get the opportunity to just, you know, see how people write, take note of how tightly they hold the, the pen or the, or if you're watching art videos on YouTube, you can do it. So, you know, there are some great artists out there, but if you look at the way some of them hold their brush, they really are holding a huge amount of tension in their hand and their wrist. Um, and so one of the things I like to do once in a while is I will try and do a painting holding the brush handle with just my 
with just the fingertip of my forefinger and the and the tip of my thumb and I'll have the other three fingers of my hand dead straight not in contact with the brush in any way now uh, you know when I'm doing videos I generally don't do that too much because I'm I, I don't feel I can operate that well with such a relaxed approach but it's a really good exercise to do uh, perhaps I'll do a video on that at some point so continuing with the small brush just putting some of those warmer light ochre tones along the the length of the left hand horn there a little bit on the tip as well and then a little bit of a time jump there now the reason I did that was you can see I've added some sort of reddish brown textured marks to the head of the cow and also on other areas of the steer and um, really that was a bit of a mistake to be honest because what happened was on my reference photo this particular steer has patches of very uh, you know areas which are very white and then in amongst that are some kind of reddish reddish textures and reddish tufts of hair and I fell into the trap because I had my small brush of doing detail too early on uh, in the painting so for that reason rather than make you sit through my mistake what I thought I'd, I'd do is just jump ahead a little bit in time and um, then you can see how I correct it, which is hopefully going to be more useful to you um, if you're watching this in terms of, you know, picking up tips for technique and that kind of thing. But I'm coming in now with my ultramarine blue and I'm just refining my drawing a little bit. So I can't remember if I mentioned this earlier in the video or not, but um, it's certainly something I do quite a lot of. So I'll draw initially, then I'll paint. And then if necessary, I'll draw back into the painting and then I'll paint again and then I'll draw back in again if necessary and I will go round and round that loop back and forth as many times as I feel is necessary and sometimes in the finished painting I'll deliberately leave regions which are very clearly drawn showing because you know um, sometimes those those areas can add to the overall image uh, so I'm just adding some outlines there now so I'll do another little time jump so what I've started to do here is go back to doing some more fundamental modeling and I want to create a greater sense of light falling down onto the animal. So I'm using some titanium white with just a little bit of cadmium yellow to pick out some of the brightest highlights. And you can see that as I do that, I'm starting to obscure some of that detail work that I did by mistake, uh, you know, by going over it with this lighter color. So, at some point in this painting I deviate quite dramatically away from the the, the reference photo uh, as I mentioned the the animal in the reference photo is a mixture of a reddish brown it's got white patches and then its head is mostly white um, but whenever I'm painting from a reference I, I really just use it as a starting point so just added a little bit more to the reflected uh, shadowy areas there on the belly and a little bit on the top of the nose as well so I'll do another little time jump now. Actually, on second thoughts, I think I'll leave things as they are um, because what's coming up next is something which hopefully will be of interest. So what I'm doing now is putting in kind of a bluey shadow. You know, the cast shadow that I put in earlier where the head of the steer is casting a shadow down along its, its chest. Well, initially that was pretty much all the same color. But what I've done now is just change the color of that shadow. So the lower half where it's on the lighter part of the hide is a rather different colour to the area which is on the darker part of the hide. And that's a really useful technique to use when you're dealing with cast shadows to remember that you can vary the colour of them depending on what the, sh what the cast shadow is falling across. Now, of course, one easy way to do that is to, say, paint all of the underlying objects. And then if you have a cast shadow going over the top of those objects, you could just simply put a glaze of a single colour. Um, that's not the way I'm working today, but it's a, you know, it's a useful way to do it because if you have a translucent glaze representing your cast shadow, then those underlying colours are going to partially sh show through and that's going to give you a shadow which is much richer and more varied in colour and tone than if you just completely, even if it's a very dark shadow, you know, do a really dark glaze or maybe just do several glazes to build up really rich and wonderful darks um, but as you can see uh, having got that color on the brush I'm now doing my usual thing and I'm working my way 
around the entire animal, adding this colour, you know, where I think it's going to help. So having uh, moved that colour all over the cow, I'm going back to establishing, you know, the, the modelling of the, of the animal. So having put the highlights in a little bit earlier, I'm now adjusting the shadows. So just adding a darker version of some of the purpley shadows that I used before. And uh, I just had a little bit of dried paint there in the mix, which is why I was picking it off with the brush. Um, and I've just added some of that to the right hand side of the torso. And now I'm overlaying with that same color on that cast shadow from the head. So although I'm not actually using a glaze medium, I am kind of using that cast shadow multi-layer technique in a very gentle way. That, you know, the technique I mentioned just a moment ago. Adding some more of that dark shadow colour to the legs. And so really, um, each stage of the painting, for the, for, for the most part, is a repetition of the very initial stages. You know, there's a bit of drawing. We're adding a dark shade, a light shade and a medium, a medium tone. And then we're gradually refining those and adding to them. And in doing that, just like with the cast shadow technique we mentioned before, we're building up layer upon layer and just inching gradually towards the result we want. So the cow is looking at, you know, um, the steer is looking a little anemic, perhaps, in the face at the moment. Um, and the colour of the head kind of blends a little bit too readily into the colour of the horn. So we'll maybe address that in a little bit. Um, I've just given the surface of the painting a spray with the water again. And I'm coming back in with a nice orangey brown. So mixed up from cadmium yellow, uh, some magenta and a little bit of the ultramarine blue again. And once again, because it's the interactive acrylics, having that wet surface, there's going to be a little bit of slight blending when I go over the dark shadow that I've done. And you can see that I'm now starting to add some of that orangey colour to the head as well. But I'm still keeping my brush strokes nice and loose, even at this fairly developed stage. So we don't want to sort of tighten up too much, you know, regardless of where we are in the painting. So you can see where I added the orangey brown there to the, to the light area I put on before. We got a nice little bit of subtle blending there just on the front of the chest in between the front legs. And um, we can get a range of colours. So that, that little technique works quite well. So continuing with that theme, I've added a little bit of white to the same colour, and I'm just kind of blending that in to some of the highlights that I've used earlier on. Coming in close to the horn now. And that's going to help the, the right hand horn stand out from the body a lot more than it was before. So as I mentioned earlier, this particular steer does have quite a lot of patterning on its hide. But unless you're going for you know, a super photorealistic effect, sometimes that can make for too cluttered an image when it comes to your painting. So my instinct is to simplify things. So I will use the patterning on the hide, but only the bits I want to use, or maybe I'll even change the patterning. And you can see I'm now, having mentioned how anemic the, the steer's head was looking, I'm now adding even more of that orangey brown to the, uh, to the head. And it gives a kind of more unified feel and makes the horns definitely more distinct from the head itself. And just a little bit of that same orange colour on the nose. So the, the head was feeling a little bit disconnected from the body visually uh, when we looked at the painting and there's much more of a flow of continuous colour now. Just extending the that area of pale shadow now so that it matches up rather better with the, the darker half a bit higher up. And I'm back to my small round brush, as you can see. So 
So, you know, as I mentioned just a moment ago, there's a little bit more flow in terms of colour now. We've got some nice orange browns on both the head and the torso and on the lower parts of the legs. Um, and there's a greater sense of light than I had earlier on in the painting because I established those highlights. Now, that said, there's still not quite the amount of warmth that I that I want in this image. So we'll, we'll deal with that later. What I'm doing now with the small brush is just going over some of the work I've done to reintroduce some of those patterned areas. So I mentioned a moment ago that, you know, I'm happy to have some of the patterning, but I, I don't necessarily include all of it. So adding some highlights onto the top of the, the cow's head now. So before I had a very pale part of the cow's head and I said, you know, there wasn't enough contrast. So then I blocked it in with orange. And now I'm going kind of back on myself, really, and, and adding some more highlights in again. But this time, hopefully, I'm going to be a little bit more selective, not add too much sort of fiddly detail. But we still want a sense of light on, to, on, to, on the cow's head. We don't want it to be a flat outline. So we still managed to keep the flow there between head and body. There's some loose patterning on the body, some white patches, and there's a little bit of loose highlights on the, on the head. Coming back in with my darker blue now and adding a line of shadow between the head and the and the torso. So I really like using ultramarine blue for my shadows or deep purples for, or for my line work, especially um, because I feel for the palette I use, it really makes the colours sing in comparison to those lines. Um, I very rarely, if ever, use black unless I'm perhaps mixing up a grey or I'm working, you know, or I'm just working in black and white. So we're going back to this idea of paint, draw, paint, draw. So a little bit of, a little bit of drawing there going on. So even the tail, the kind of wispy tail, has been created with a few layers of paint. There was the very first layer, and then I did a second one, which was wispy, and then I've just added a little touch of shadow there. And now I'm taking a similar technique but with highlights. So I'm now outlining different parts but with a highlight colour. And although it may look like completely pure white on camera, I will have added just a little touch of blue to that just to just so that it, it isn't too saturated a highlight. So when I'm doing outline work, um, I will try to vary the thickness of the line, the texture of the line and the colour of the line. As I'm, as I'm drawing around. So um, I hadn't noticed at the time and, you know, I could perhaps have left it as it was actually looking at it now, but I decide later on that the, the left hand nostril on the cow is rather too low and, and kind of, or it may be a result of what I do in a moment actually, now that I think about it. But um, nevertheless, the basic technique for depicting the nostrils is, is there. And that is to patch in some dark areas to depict the shadow regions and then to pick out the highlights around the edge. So I've added some more highlights onto the, the nose of the animal. That isn't working quite as well as I'd hoped, but um, again, we'll address that later. And again, I'm just refining that outline along the top of the head as well. So the left hand side needed a little adjustment. And now that I've done that, you can see that the, the snout is tipped a little bit too far down to the left and in fact needs you know, further correction. And I'm just narrowing the head as well. So one of the things which happens sometimes uh, when I'm painting away is that in looking at specific aspects of the image and getting those right, Sometimes the marks we make can throw out, throw out the proportion of something else, which was perhaps previously OK, or perhaps, you know, it was all it was wrong in the beginning. But some work you do elsewhere really sort of highlights the mistake you've made. Other times it's simply just a case of, oh, I hadn't noticed that before. I hadn't noticed that that was wrong, you know, and, and I just didn't pick up on the mistake. So so, for example, I don't know whether any of you have noticed, but um, it took me a while to sort of think, well, what, you know, what's wrong with this image? What, there's something isn't quite right. Well, I haven't included any ears on the steer at the moment. And the reason for that is in my reference, uh, the, well, the left hand ear isn't visible at all. And the right hand ear is kind of tucked up and behind 
the right hand horn. It is just about visible, but it's in quite deep shadow. So going with my approach of not worrying about detail, I kind of missed that and it took me a little while to identify it. Um, you can see I've just added some dark blue outlines to the horn, to the left hand horn to refine that outline. And I'm coming in doing something similar, just you know, redefining the structure of the head. So again, using a blue outline, and this is doing two things. One, it's I'm just adding to the shadows there on the right hand horn, but one, it's sort of allowing me to refine the line of the horn and just make sure I've got that right. But it's also allowing me to look and see, well, how would this thing start to look with a, a darker background? Is that going to be better than the rather hazy light blue color that I've got at the moment? And, you know, I'm kind of thinking at the moment, OK, I think this probably would look best, better with a darker blue background. So for that reason, I'm coming in now with more of my ultramarine blue. But you can see this time I've got far less titanium white in the mix. So I'm doing this for two reasons. One, as I said, I think it's going to look better with a darker background. But two, it's going to allow me to just remove some of that corrective line work that I've done on the head. So I mentioned earlier that I sometimes like to leave some of the drawing in place uh, and visible in the finished product. And that's still true, but I'll only do that if I feel it will enhance the finished image. Um, so just sort of crude mistakes or things I don't like, I will generally cover those up, you know, so that they can't be seen. Um, but it does depend. It does depend on what, what I'm doing. If it's a rather looser treatment, then sometimes I, I just don't mind at all if it's more of a sketch. Very happy to see, for people to see the three, four, five, six iterations I went through to get to the finished product. But in those situations, the early marks are generally just lighter and, and you know, more free flowing rather than the rather considered and heavier lines I put down there. So for that reason, I felt the need to remove those. You can see I'm just doing a bit of blending now uh, of the lighter blue into the darker blue. Um, and that darker blue, it'll, it'll improve it. The image will improve once the paint is dry because you're getting a little bit of glare off the blue there. But um, that's definitely improved things, I feel. Just coming in with a paper towel now to, to aid the blending. Um, so once that blue background dries back, we'll, we'll be able to get a much better view of how that darker colour is working against the, the, the rest of the steer. But hopefully you can see that the orangey brown of the hide is much better complemented by that darker blue than it was by the light blue and the highlights seem brighter as well. So we're starting to get more of a sense of strong sunlight, which is more in keeping with the strength of cast shadow that I've got there on the ground. Now I'm continuing with these blue outlines around the horn and the head of the steer. So this is yet another refinement of some of the line work I did before. Now, for some reason, with this particular animal, I struggled a little bit more than I do sometimes. I'm, I'm not quite sure why, to be honest. This happens sometimes, you know, even if you do a lot of painting, a lot of drawing. Then from time to time, you know, naturally some things are going to go more smoothly than others. Um, but I felt I needed to make further corrections. And you can see now that the, the nose is looking a little bit lopsided, um, in part due to those corrections. So I'm just adding some of the... The background colour there to, to obscure the uh, stuff I've, I've chosen to remove from the left hand side of the animal's head. But um, some parts I feel are working rather well so I quite like the colours in the torso. I think that works quite well and uh, I, I like the sense of movement that we've got with the animal here. It's kind of, it feels like he's walking from right to left. Now coming in again with a paler colour. So this is what, the third, fourth, fifth time I've, I've adjusted the head now. So having put those white highlights on, I'm now covering them up yet again. So it keeps coming back to this idea of simplification and keeping a sense of coherence with the colour scheme across the entire animal. So you can see I've just loosened up my brush strokes again, gone back to my larger brush popped a few of those pale orange highlights uh, onto the torso and also blocked in the nose as well. So I'm kind of finding my way with this one. This, you know, as you've probably gathered by now, 
this particular video isn't so much a tutorial or a demo. It's more, it's more just kind of me, sort of you guys watching in as I find my way to making this painting work. So coming in now with kind of more of a mid-brown. And just sort of softening some of the, the contrast I've got between the, the dark shadow regions and the mid-tones. Continuing that colour onto the lower rear leg. And the other one back up to the torso, keeping the brush strokes curved as, as I usually do when I'm painting a rounded surface. So it's tempting in these situations to kind of, you know, abandon the painting. Not, not because it's going terribly, necessarily, because I, I don't feel that it, that it is. But, um, you know, sometimes it's tempting to go, well, OK, I've kind of learned from, from these mistakes. Perhaps I'll just start afresh and, and try and get it right. And I do do that sometimes, but often I find that I learn the most from the ones I struggle with a little bit. Um, so, again, I'm adding yet another layer of a slightly different brown onto the, onto the torso, onto the belly again. So that's more of a neutral brown, it's less orangey, so there's, there's more of a balance, there's a bit more blue in this one. So again, I've mixed it up with magenta, the cadmium yellow, but I've added more of the ultramarine blue there. And as we mentioned earlier, by playing around with those three primary colours, you can get a, you know, a huge range of different browns and things. But this colour scheme is starting to work rather better than what I had before, I feel. Putting in some pale colour, pale sort of yellowy brown. It's almost, a, it's almost a yellow ochre, isn't it, on the belly there. Now just pondering where to go next while I've still got that colour on my brush. So something, something I'm doing here, I'm just adding that same colour on the horns. And again, it's about keeping a flow of colour across the image. So what I'll do often is, even if that colour isn't present on the reference, I'll just add a little bit so that the colour occurs almost everywhere on the animal. And that helps the viewer's eye kind of bounce around the image in a, in a fairly natural way. Because you, you tend to naturally pick out spots of the same colour, I think. So you notice I've more or less obliterated the nostrils that I had before. And I'm, what I'm doing now is I'm resisting the temptation to go back to my small brush. I'm just using the, the edge of that flat brush to indicate some of the smaller features. Trying not to fall into that trap of getting too fussy. Adjusting the eye a little bit there. Now you can probably see a little bit of bounce in the paper as I'm pushing down with the brush. That's because the, the paper's you know, reasonably wet at the moment because I've been spraying it with water. But this mixed media paper is really very good. You know, once that dries out, it really tends not to buckle. So one of the ways I work when I'm perhaps getting a little bit confused in terms of the direction I'm heading in with my painting is I will simplify things as much as I can. And so what I mean by that is imagine you've got a subject which has got a, a whole lot of different colours in it, maybe 10, 12, 15 different colours. And that's before you start considering all the different tones of those colours. Then one way to approach it is to just say, OK, I'm going to more or less ignore colour or limit myself to two or three colours and just work tonally. And then what you can do is towards the end of the painting, just perhaps add a touch of the additional colours here and there. Uh, and that also works with the patterning that I mentioned before. So, as I've said previously in this little video, you know, I've removed much of the patterning. But another approach would have been to just completely ignore the fact that there's any patterning. Ignore the fact that there's more than one colour on this steer. And just treat it simply as a brown steer. That's it. You know, and, and just do that. And, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, that might have saved me a little bit of effort here. But nevertheless, I'm, you know, pressing on here with my 
with my flat brush and continuing with these more gestural marks. So I've kind of taken it, you know, back a step, going back to the the looser mark making that I prefer to make, and just adding some highlights again to the to the to the head of the steer. So next up, coming back in with some more bluey shadows. Just to kind of help that uh, rear leg recede, recede a little bit. So that's worked reasonably well, I feel. That's kind of pushed that rear leg back to the far side of the torso. And I'm just adding a couple of, I've just added a couple of touches of there to the to the torso and the underside of the horns. So sorry about the focus problem. That'll come back in just a second. There we go. Um, and again, but I think what I will do with this particular painting is we'll make the background much darker eventually because um, the the orange in in this uh, in the color of this animal that I've used it's not really coming out quite as much as I would like. So we'll, we'll make we'll go with a darker blue background and uh, that'll help that orange really pop a lot more. Um, but before we do that, I've just added some really dark areas to the to the eyes. So this is a mix of ultramarine blue and a touch of burnt umber. Uh, but that that um, left hand nostril, you can see I've just painted, I've still managed to paint that a little bit too low. So uh, that'll need to be corrected in a bit. Now I wanted to sort of just change the the, the color scheme of, of that main shadow just a little bit because it was very much just blue. So I've just gone for more of a purple color there. So there's a little bit more. I think I actually added cadmium red to my palette there. So so one of the advantages of having just the magenta and the yellow, as I mentioned earlier, is that it forces you to kind of mix up a variety of reds. However, that said, sometimes that can become a little bit tiresome. So. If I am getting a bit tired of doing that, then I'll just add a bit of cadmium red to, to the palette. And that kind of gives you a shortcut to a certain range of purples. But again, it just depends, you know, what you're looking to do and how you like to work. Um, it's, you know, I don't have any really, really fixed rules for, for any of the work I do. I want to stay a little bit flexible in my approach and uh, I don't want anything I do, any of the art I create, to become too laboured. And I feel that if I make any rule too strict, for example, you know, let's stick with only these three primaries, then, you know, I'm kind of limiting myself in a way I don't want to. I definitely like that limitation as a starting point for a painting or a drawing or whatever. And I might say, OK, I'm only going to use two colours. Yeah, that's a really good starting point. It's really nice to restrict yourself and limit your options, it forces you to make interesting decisions. But then later on in, in the process, when the thing has started to take a bit of a life of its own and you're looking at it as something that you want to bring to completion, then it's a case of, OK, well, you know, maybe I will have a third colour. Maybe I'll break that rule that I, that I imposed on myself at the beginning. But what I've been doing while I was chatting away there is I'm just cleaning up the outline of that rear leg. So with a very pale blue. And these little touches, these little adjustments to the outlines at this stage, they can really help you realise how close to completion you are with a particular piece of work. Something which is looking, you know, just not quite right, and you can't work out why. If you just go back round and clean up some of the outlines and the edges, some of the line work, which has perhaps gone a little bit astray, the minor adjustments, you know, they, they really do make a difference. When I used to paint uh, a lot of portraits, quite often, I would wonder, well, why is this likeness not quite working? And then I'd go around and perhaps shave, you know, just by using a bit of extra background, take off maybe a, a millimetre or two from the outline of the head, where the hair was a bit too big on one side, and all of a sudden the person would come to life in the painting. So it, it doesn't take very much of an adjustment, uh, especially with living things, with animals and people to go from being something which is really very cool to look at and has really captured the essence of the being to, oh, that doesn't, that doesn't quite work. And certainly if you're looking to depict the expression of a person, 
you know, a fraction of a millimetre in the way the eyes are positioned or the direction they're looking, that can really change things dramatically. So a little bit of a zoom in and I just need to fill in a little, there's a little sort of bit missing from the, from the steer's head there. So I've just filled that in. So this is kind of a, almost a, just a pale bright orange I've got here. And I quite like the, the way that's um, adding a bit of, bit of warmth to the highlights. So I'm still using a flat brush. This one is uh, slightly narrower than the half inch I was using before. So just taking a moment to, sorry about the little bits of uh, inactivity on screen there, but that's basically me just sort of stepping back just for a few seconds and thinking, you know, what, what do I need to do next? And I like that sort of uh, salmon -y orange, pale orange so much that I decided to continue that along the, the top of the head and over the top of the right eye as well. And that's really starting to add, that, that's working really well, I feel, against the orangey browns. But uh, we definitely need to go darker with this background at some point because the very pale, almost white background I've got below the mouth and along the, the left hand foreleg of the, of the steer, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not really working very well for me there. And also the, the horns don't seem particularly bright and shiny. And I think that would be greatly improved with a darker background. So we'll, we'll come back and, and do that in just a bit. But still continuing with this little brush. Just adding some of that pale orange on top. So, so that's helping again. To, so we've gradually, incrementally been working towards this feeling of you know, warmth and sunshine. A little bit of cross hatching there I just did. So a little bit of dry brush going across the the dark and the light areas of the upper right hand front leg. And that's another way of kind of softening the boundary between light and dark. You don't have to just do blending. You know, you could use a drawing technique within your, within your painting. Uh, and that's something that I really enjoy doing actually. So bringing a little bit of a cop, the dry brush gives you a way of drawing and painting at, at, within one brush stroke. So coming back to this nose, which is, I've lost count now of how many times I've tried to get these nostrils right, but uh, I'm just doing a little bit of uh, corrective surgery here. And that didn't quite work. Went a bit astray with the larger brush, so just lifted that off with a piece of paper towel. But the problem I've got here, and I don't know why I wasn't quicker to see it really, but um, uh, Part of it, I think, is sometimes when I'm filming, because I tend to, the way, I, the way I work is I've got the camera obviously head on to the, uh, onto the painting, so I tend to be standing off to one side, and that perhaps distorts my perspective a little bit. But, but no, yeah, no excuses, I, I should have got it right. But for some reason, that, I, I didn't spot that that nostril was as low as it is uh, until you know, quite a way on in the painting. And now what I'm doing is I'm having a bit of fun, really, because I've got that little band of blue curving around the lower part of the right hand horn. And I like this pale yellowy orange I've got so much, and I thought it would contrast well against that blue. So I just popped a couple of patches in on the right hand horn and I just added a little highlight to the very tip of the left horn. And I've just done the same on the right, just off screen there. And my hope is when I put a, a much deeper blue in the background, the colours in those horns are going to come to life a bit more. So back to my small round brush and you know back to the nose here. Now what I've spotted at this point is the the outline of the nose isn't quite right so I'm just bringing that out to the left a little bit more and for the most part the left side of the, the nose is kind of obscured with a bluey shadow so I'm adding some of that as well and just tidying up the line of the mouth because you know it's the same with people and animals the expression that we have to, to make the expression convincing we have to work on the corners of the eyes generally speaking and the corners of the mouths uh, yeah obviously that's a, there are other things as well like you know furrows in the brow and you know flared nostrils and that kind of stuff but for the most part corners of the eyes corner and you know corners of the mouth that's what helps you know give us a, an expression 
So I'm coming in now and adding a few more highlights to the nose. So I really, really do need to darken this background a bit. But we, we will get to that. So what I did then, as you saw, is I just sprayed that area with uh, some water. And that's allowing me to, you know, just gives the this interactive acry acrylic enough fluid fluidity that I can go in with my little brush and just produce some really soft highlighted areas. So when you're working with conventional acrylic, it, it's fantastic at putting down very clearly defined patches of colour with hard edges. But if you want to just sort of soften those a little bit, it, it does work with normal acrylic fairly well, but, it's, it, you know, you're still on a bit of a time crunch with the interactive acrylic you can paint into a wet surface just very lightly and get these lovely sub subdued highlights. Uh, so, you know, it's a really uh, wonderful advantage of these paints. So this snouts, you know, as I've been chatting away here, you can see it's starting to look a little bit better now. It's looking a little bit more realistic, uh, you know, within the realms of realism that I work. You know, it's not photographic, but it looks structurally much better with some rather gentle highlights, so, so that's working okay. And next, the thing to do is to add some slightly stronger highlights to those subtle bright areas that we've uh, included just a moment ago. And so once again, it's this layered approach. So you can have kind of a blended underlayer and then slightly starker, brighter highlights on top of that. So improving the structure of the nose there has, has helped things quite a bit overall, I feel. The animal, the anatomy of the animal seems to hang together better as a whole. So just making some further refinements now on the left hand side of the head, uh, because that left hand side is in a little bit more shadow than I actually had before. So we're continuing with that reddish purple shadow. And in doing that, I'm also able to just ever so subtly refine the, the line of the left hand edge of the head as well. Now, I mentioned earlier that the ears were missing from the head of this uh, steer. So that's what I'm doing now. And I'm just keeping them still fairly hidden in shadow as they are in the reference, but I'm making them more prominent in my painting than they than they actually appear in my reference photo. Um, what I'll actually do is I'll put a link to the reference photo because it's one I just found on Pixabay, because as I mentioned, I think near the start of the video, not too many Texas Longhorns in Devon, so I haven't had the opportunity to acquire my own reference photos. So I'll put the link to the reference photo uh, from the Pixabay website in the description below this video. So the couple of things you'll notice if you check out that link. The first thing is that my painting, you know, is definitely not an exact replica of, um, of the reference, and it's not intended to be either. Um, the other thing is I'm doing a mirrored version of that reference photo. So that's something I'll do quite often. If I do have to resort to using a reference from uh, a royalty free website, you know, which is available to the public, then just to try and give things my own twist, I will either only, you know, depict a part of that animal or I'll mirror the image. Or I'll change the background, change the colors. So while I do definitely use them as reference from time to time, I don't really want to produce something that is likely to be produced by another artist. I want each of my images to be as unique as they can be. So while I was chatting away there, I've just added a few more areas of shadow. Now, what I'm doing here on that back foot is there was a little bit of white uncoated paper between the bottom of the foot and the ground. And, and so I've just kind of suggested a little bit of movement. I'm doing the same with some of the other feet. Um, on the bottoms of the feet there with just some rather loose brush strokes. And that right eye just needs some further modification. So we talked earlier about the expression being in particular, you know, in the corners of the eyes. And with animals, it's often quite important to get the little areas of cast shadow you've got under their brows. And, you know, equally, the highlighted areas where 
where the light is catching the brow itself. And there are often quite interesting creases in the flesh or the hide, uh, little tufts of hair, and all of those things you can selectively depict. You know, not, not really my thing to try and depict every single hair, but by just, you know, picking a few out here and there, you can capture the character of, of the animal quite well. So I added a, you know, another bright highlight there on the nostril. So using some titanium white now. So just little areas of completely opaque white. And those little touches I'm just doing now on the left, they add a little bit of texture to the outline to help suggest that you've got, you know, a hairy animal. And just enhancing some of the highlights on the horns as well. And a few little touches here and there on the body too. So things are starting to come together. Uh, just adding a few more of those highlights here and there around the body. And little areas of texture as well, like I'm doing on the hindquarters there. Little bits of fluffiness and frayed edges on the outline. And then pretty soon what I'm going to do is block in this background, as I mentioned earlier, a couple of times with a darker blue to try and make things a little bit more dramatic in terms of the lighting. So up until now, the only blue that I've used has been the ultramarine blue. But what I'm doing here, it's a mixture of phthalo blue and titanium white. So this is a it's more of a sort of coral blue in uh, in color. And in fact, you know, next time I'm down in Cornwall painting the sea, I think I'm definitely going to bring some of this blue with me. So because I think it's really going to be uh, wonderful to use this blue and it's going to allow, allow me to mix some wonderful sea greens as well. So I'll, I'll, I'll show you, you know, what I'm doing here, just the initial stages of this background. So what I'm doing is I'm obviously coloring in the background, but as I'm going around, I'm also making minor adjustments and improvements to the outline of the animal to just clean up those edges where they, I feel they need it and or just refine the outline as well. And in terms of the brush strokes I use, generally speaking, the direction of the brush strokes will be uh, almost at 90 degrees to the edge, but, but not always. You know, sometimes I'll just follow the line of the outline if I feel it adds a sense of movement. So there, there you can see I've blocked in the whole background and having that more uniform background uh, and a different blue, I feel really starts to make the orange of the hide of the animal sing and brings out some of the yellows and the highlights as well. Uh, as you can probably tell, as I've moved down towards the horizon line, I have added slightly more titanium white. And while I was chatting there, I've also added a little hint of some sort of purpley shadow in amongst the cast shadow, which also featured some of that phthalo blue, just to, just to include that little bit of colour coherence across the image again. Coming in with some burnt umber now, just adding a little extra shadow to that right hand ear and a few more neutral brown shadows, just little touches here and there. So that line coming down from the underside of the chin of the steer. And using that same colour just to refine the edge of that upper lip there as well. So it's surprising what a difference these little touches can make uh, in terms of creating a convincing image. So they're well worth looking for. Uh, but hopefully you can see if you look at the, the, say the left hand horn or both horns, in fact, and the line of the back and the head, I feel I feel that sort that blue has really sort of helped pull pull the whole thing together. And notice the rear quarters, which I haven't spent too much time talking about. I've deliberately left those less detailed than the head of the animal where we want the, the viewers focus to be. So I generally work by keeping things fairly loose and then having a particular section of the animal far more detailed than the rest. And what I'm doing now is having included the right hand ear, I'm just popping in an indication of the left hand ear as well. So I'm not too worried about great level of detail with these ears, but I just want the animal to have some ears so that it, so that it looks complete really. So I should say that I've let the 
the background dry almost completely before I painted on these little details. Now adding just a little bit of a highlight to the ears. And then to finish off, I want to just add a little bit, you know, a couple of areas of very deep dark. So what I do to do that is I mix up some burnt umber with ultramarine blue. And I'm going to add just some touches of that to the nostrils to get those very, the, deep, the deepest of deep shadows. And also just a little touch on the right hand eye as well. Uh, and then that's this uh, painting of a steer pretty much finished. So let me show you once I've once I've painted in these nostrils, I'll show you the the finished painting. And and as you can see, I've included a little signature just to the right of the steer. And I'm also going to um, also going to crop off the right hand side of the image, which you can see there. As always, you, if you want to get a close up at some look at some of the brushwork, you can click on the link in the description to view the high resolution image of the finished painting on my website. But in the meantime, I'll just say thank you very much for watching. Please remember to like, comment and subscribe. And I look forward to seeing you next Sunday for the next episode of The Sunday Art Show. Thanks very much for watching.